This is Heroes for Sale. It is uh, episode 54 and uh, still in the chair driving things. Uh, the big boss lady, Sue, from Heroes for Sale. How you doing, Sue? <laughs> I'm really good. We need to somehow make these bigger and better than when Stu does them. So when he comes back, he doesn't get to come back in there. Because <laughs> I'm really enjoying them. I actually really enjoyed the last one. That was good fun. Did <laughs> now, the question is, did Stu enjoy the last one? Yes, he did, but I think he cried a bit because he wasn't in it. <laughs> right. So missing it. Yeah, no, he did. He liked well, the, the Batman call out. Great, great. Well, we did try to get him <laughs> on for this one, but it's too too many car horns and beeping and background noise, so it wasn't going to work. But uh, hopefully he'll be back on one of these sooner rather than later. But let's get stuck into it because, so you know, I have been absolutely fizzing for about three months for this. <laughs> oh my goodness and when it came out it was just like oh well you know i don't know if you saw the shop video last week on shipment day ricardo mm. but i was holding up the number ones and i held this one up and i said in the video oh ricardo is gonna be wetting his pants he's gonna want to do this <laughs> on the pod <laughs> And here it is. It is um, Heroic Signatures have got Titan Comics on board. Uh, they jettisoned Marvel, and Conan the Barbarian has a new publisher. They, what they've done really well is they have gone and grabbed the guys who are doing such a good job of it at Marvel, Jim Zub and Rob De La Torre. And I mean, so yeah. I could talk about this forever, but uh, as somebody who's not maybe so dyed in the wool Conan, but as a comic lover, what did you think of Conan the Barbarian <laughs> number one on Titan? <laughs> So you and I have had conversations about Conan in the shop before. Both of us love sword and sorcery and the fantasy element. And I have loved, like, the Jason Momoa Conan movie was just one of my favourites. And that kind of made me go and read some of the Conan stuff. For the comics, I mean, first of all, it was published in Mexico, right, in 52. And then it went to Dark Horse till about 2018. And then Marvel till 2022, and now Heroic Signatures have taken on the IP and they're publishing through Titan. And I just feel like this might be a turning point to give us consistent Conan. It feels like they're going to handle this IP, as you just said, they've, they've brought on the guys that have been doing it so well. They haven't abandoned them, so they haven't actually started from scratch. So for me, it felt very familiar even though it's a new publisher and a new IP. I like what Heroic Signatures are doing with their other IPs as well. So I think they've kind of, I think it's in safe hands. And I just loved it. I just, I, I've read a little bit of the Robert E. Howard stuff. I've loved his massive map building and world building. But this, to me, felt like a brilliant inroad to Conan without doing an origin story of Conan. And I felt welcome in it. I didn't feel lost. It felt like it had all the elements of that sword and sorcery, all the imagery behind it was what I was expecting. Even the language was perfect for me. Like, I just felt like they nailed that kind of barbarian speak and I felt it was accessible. Okay, okay, Ricardo, what did you think as <laughs> the guy on Conan? Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I loved what these guys did at Marvel. Unfortunately, COVID interrupted things for them, and they got a truncated run at it, and then it got pulled. You know, I've, I felt for them, Jim Zub is a great writer. He's done some really cool stuff. Rob De La Torre's art is superb. And the other thing I think that they've done really, really well in this, and this is down to, to Rob particularly, but also um, Villa Rubia, who's doing the colouring, is, well, it looks new. There are some callbacks to some of the old art style. Yeah, Like, you can kind of see that classic Marvel Conan art style from the 70s and 80s. Uh, there, yeah, there are touches of that through it. Yeah, it's like, you know, because some of the printed, some of the old style comics, the way they looked the way they did was because their printing wasn't great, right? And they had to do the colours over different ways. So the, the colouring, you know, that's the bright capes and the older and the dot matrix kind of look in some of the printing and so through the different eras, you get that different look. They have replicated the blurriness, if you get, would you call it a, how would you describe that? That old style art that has the features, but they're, it's, it's blurred. It's not a straight, strict face. 
Yeah, 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 exactly. So it, it it has that throwback. And the other thing I think that they've done really, really well is some of the panels. And and I know I do this every time, and Stu and I talk about it as well, is that showing people comic books on a podcast isn't great. But just, you know, with the opening panels of this, the title panel, Bound in Blackstone, Scourge of the Dead, the way that the double page is used, they've done a great job in layout. They've gone across pages. It's not your yep. traditional you know, eight pains or whatever. They've done some different things, some breakouts. You can see movement. The fight scenes are really, really cool. They look, yeah. I was going to say realistic, but they're not realistic, but they, they look cool. You can see the movement. You can see everything that's going on. And yeah, blurred maybe not is, is maybe not the right word, but I know no. what you mean. It's indefinable. Some of it's indefinable. Yeah. And, and, it, and it kind of has that throwback to, to the look. And the other thing is the writing. You mentioned the writing. So it used to be there was the Conan the Barbarian run, on Marvel Comics, but they also had Savage Sword, and Savage Sword was more adult-oriented, and the Conan the Barbarian was kind of, I guess, more YA, for want of a better term. Yeah. This feels more Savage Sword. It's not Savage Sword. They're going to yes. do Savage Sword next year, but it does feel a bit yeah. more grown up. Yeah, I mean, there's there's breasts, and there's a little bit of adult, not innuendo, but there's, there's adult concept. There's a little bit more kind of thought behind what they're saying. There's, there's a not a double entendre, but there's a layer to it in some of the conversation. And I loved that. They're not dumbing anything down for us. They're, yeah, I, I thought the dialogue was brilliant. What you're saying about the panel layouts, this was the use of the comic medium brilliantly executed because even though they did some double page spreads and they came outside of the paneling and it wasn't a strict square panel, the dialogue, the way they did that, and whoever did this is just a genius. So the ones who ever, uh, who did do the lettering, Richard Starkings. Oh, okay, I'm going to be looking up some of his stuff because the way he's done the lettering has actually really helped in the way with this panel layout and the way your eye is drawn through and the way you don't lose where you're supposed to be. So the abstractness of that is all of it's pulled together to just be brilliant. It's brilliant. It's so cleverly done. And, and there's also a little bit of a, a throwback as well that I, I quite like, uh, which goes back to the sort of the Roy Thomas stuff that we were mentioning earlier is even on the title page where it's, you know, got the name of the writer, the artist, the color artist, the letter, they've all got nicknames, which is what yeah. they, they used to do. So, you know, it's Grim, Jim, Zub, and Ravaging, Rob De La Torre, and, and, and all of that. I, I just love that. They've embraced uh, the history of Conan and, and the fandom of Conan, uh, but yeah. they've done it in their own way. So it's not a rinse and repeat. It is something new, it is something different, it is something, as I said, a little bit more grown up, but it's very, yeah. very cool. Yeah. It's not the blurring, it's the colouring that's kind of setting it back in that era as well. It's, yeah, the colouring in it is just exquisite. Yeah, there's lots of purples and pinks and faded reds and things like that, right? Yeah. Which you don't and, necessarily, you know, think you're going to see in a Conan comic, but that's they've used it really well. They've done it really well. And I just love in the fight scenes and every single sword's got blood on it. You yeah. Know? And, and there's axes in there and it's just... It's just so gorgeous. I felt welcome in the story, but I felt respected in the story as someone who wanted to see Conan done well. Yeah, I, I think so. I think they've done a fantastic job. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. It's everything, <laughs> it's everything I wanted when, okay. when when I heard Titan had it. So I, I, they've done a great job. I love it. Was there anything in it that you didn't like or didn't expect or that kind of might have is a little irk in there i mean you're such a conan guy well the thing that i think marvel at times in the past have lost about conan and about robert e howard's work is that it's sword and sorcery but it's also fucking weird like robert e howard put lots of weird shit in his stories yeah. that wasn't necessarily explainable like you know the elephant in the tower i mean that's an alien that looks like an elephant but with a man's body that basically just wanted help and and telepathically talk to Conan, right? For example, there's just weird shit that happens in his stories that's not definable just by saying it's sword and sorcery. And they've captured that as well. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, to be honest, I, it's, I find it hard to fault. And I know I'm a fan, but sometimes as a fan, I can't like, you know, I've, I've collected for a long time and I picked up some cheap old 80s Conan comics, Marvel yeah. Conan comics. And I, I like the Savage Sword stuff. Flip through just the Marvel Conan and the Barbarians. 
doesn't really crank my handle anymore because it's just a little bit too vanilla. Right. Uh, and and so I've got the ability to go, I don't really like that because I'm a Howard fan more than I'm a Marvel fan, for example. But uh, but this this gets it. So can I just ask, because I don't know the whole lore of Conan or anything, but the chick that walked, came and warned them about the onslaught coming, yeah. she's from, where's she from? She's but, um, Pictish. Is that a natural alliance that Conan would have had with a, another warring tribe, or is this is this an unusual connection? Is this a yeah? Kind it's of a, a, so it, it's weird through the Robert E. Howard timeline and the different characters. Like Brack McMorn was is another one of his who was a Pictish king fighting against the Romans trying to save his people. Right. Uh, and and Cull the Conqueror and King Cull the Picts were allies, but in the Conan stories the Picts are oft, often the enemy. Right. Because I kind of had that feel, but th- like he wouldn't have normally teamed up with her in any way. But yeah, oh, that's cool. That's cool. So it's going to be another element. She's going along with him, isn't she? She's not abandoning him. No, they are going together. They're, they're basically going together because everybody else is dead. Spoiler Does, alert. Okay. Does Conan, <laughs> who's Conan's love interest normally? Well, he has a couple. Uh, the Probably the, the two big ones are Valeria and uh, Billet. Right. And yeah. like, so the Swords of the Black Coast and all that stuff is, is Bailet or Bailet, depending on how you want to say it. And Valeria has obviously been in there before as well. But this is a story where he doesn't have one. Well, yeah. yet. Yeah. I mean, I'm well, not no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so. Maybe. Um, so, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, there was no consistent love interest. Right. Yeah. Because I picked up a couple of issues of the Bailet series and I quite enjoyed that. I like yeah. Yeah. The, it the tends story. tends to be if you're Conan's love interest, you tend to die at the end of a story arc. <laughs> Good lord. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so how old is he in this? I couldn't kind of figure it out. And he's does... probably in his mid twenties because right. he said he's been wandering for eight years and he ends up back in Samaria. And he in the battle, the first battle where he bloods himself as a warrior and decides he wants to see more, yeah. he's about sixteen. Yeah, okay. Cool. That makes sense. All right, so there you go. Conan the Barbarian via Titan, Heroic Signatures, uh, Jim Zub, Rob De La Torre, and Jose Villarubia doing the colouring. Fantastic. It was Fantastic. brilliant. Yeah, really it was so good. <laughs> and, and, and we've kind of gone on a bit of a theme here too, haven't we, see this episode? Because oh. Stu loves his sci-fi, but not so much his fantasy. And we've pretty much gone all fantasy. Well, we've got oh, a bit of horror God. in there too, but... I looked at it after you left, after we'd just chosen everything. I looked at it and I thought, what have we done? It's everything we like. <laughs> hey, why not? Well, the cat's away, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So what do you? What would you like to do next? Well, I think we should do Dynamite's Fire and Ice. Oh, my goodness. Now, this is written by Bill Willingham, who's, who did the Fable stuff. Yep. So um, it's a, it, yeah, it's a prequel to Frank Frazetta's Fire and Ice movie. It's like the 40th anniversary that they've done this on. Um, and the Frazetta family actually contacted Bill Willingham to do it. Um, I think it's the granddaughter of Frazetta. Yes, yeah, Sarah. Yeah. And so she actually contacted, she was told to contact Bill Willingham. He'd be the greatest guy to do it. She hadn't read any of his work. She contacted him, talked to him for a little while, said he sounded like her granddad. Frank Frazetta, yep. and then went and read Fables, and then that was it. So he'd been chosen. And as a prequel, I mean, just I, what a task because, you know, the difficulty with writing a prequel is that you've got to make sure that the action and character building doesn't reveal any traits of people or events that are a surprise to the characters in the original main story mm. movie. So Bill had to have... Lan and Tigra meet for the first time in the movie, right? So they can't meet in the prequel comic, but he had to have them both in it. And I think he's done it so, so very well. I loved the idea that Tigra and her, like her mum was from the forest and so, and Tigra was like this princess. And so she comes and takes her for adventures in the forest and that kind of opens it all up. The mum and daughter are doing stuff in the forest. He's in there crazily as part of, another part of the story and they kind of are going to be in the same world but not cross paths and I think Bill's got his work cut out for him but I think if anyone can do it he can. I've enjoyed book one it finished too soon for me to be honest and 
I wasn't yeah. sure what I was going to get. Like I bought the Death Dealer series that Dynamite also did with Sarah Frazetta in yeah. the Frazetta family. And I thought the story was poor, right? Yeah. I, I bought it for the artwork, but I yeah. thought the story was poor. But the story in this is really good. What do you think about the artwork in this? I like the artwork as well. Leonardo Manco. Don't I'm not familiar that familiar with his stuff, but so I don't know if this is him trying to ape Frazetta or it's just they've chosen him because of that's his style. But there are some very Frazetta elements to a lot of the artwork in this. Yeah. There there was also a few moments that I thought were, were very not Frazetta. I can't oh. When the two brothers are talking and having the you know the two the two brothers, the the uh the witch's sons, yeah. that's not particularly Frazetta. But then some of the more some of the landscapes and some of the wider shots, the yes. closest the closest stuff not so much. But yeah. I mean where are those warriors who have gone and captured uh, the boy to take to take him? Where they are going through that sort of tundra? That is a very kind of Frazetta looking scene. Yes, and the the faces of the uh, of yeah. the men as well are very Frazetta looking. So yeah, I, I think they've struck a really really good balance. And like I said, I I thought it finished well. I, I felt like it finished too soon. I'm like, oh, where's it? When's the next one? I I'll, know. I'll, if... I'll, I wanted to keep going. I love I love how like he's giving Necron the older brother so that he can kind of show how he became the crown prince without doing origin story of him becoming the crown prince. And the Dark Wolf character, apparently Bill is not going to give us an origin of him. He's not going to cement that. He likes the myth and the fantasy and the not knowing around him, but he's doing things like putting him, he's going to observe and be like interact every now and then and there's a monument to him in the background of a scene which kind of makes you think that he's immortal or Mm. something's going on with him but Bill has said that's one that he's going to leave alone he's just going to leave the mystery of that and I really respect that I I love the idea of that just going to give us enough to keep us happy with what's rolling along so is this going to be three parts like like the Death Dealer was as well? Yeah, I think it is, isn't it? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. So, no, fantastic. And some great scenes, some great artwork. Uh, uh, without giving out any spoilers, there's a campfire scene that gets interrupted by a raid. And <laughs> that scene is just like, wow. Like that, that page is just like there's so much going on. And once again, like captured the movement really, really well. You know, of, yeah. of, of guys, sinewy guys in battle, if you like. So and, and they do, jungle woman. Yeah, I they, love they, them. Yeah, they do. They've done it really, really well. Fire and Ice, uh, Bill Willingham, and Leonardo Manco uh, recommend that as well. Whether you're just a sword and sorcery person, a fantasy person, or if you're you're a fan of the movie or a Frazetta fan. Well, and there's going to be there's going to be palace intrigues and everything in it as well. So it's kind of going to cross over to. All sorts of fantasy elements. Oh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to see what else they do because, you know, Frazetta did so many iconic paintings that <laughs> you could then, I mean, you know, I, I, I know that Stu isn't a fan. We've talked about it before, but there was a <laughs> Veritic did a, a title called Jaguar God, which was based, and that was a Frazetta cover, and it was the story just came from a Frazetta painting. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, you got the, all the classics there, like the Sea Witch and all of those, so... There is, yeah. I'm a big Frazetta fan as well. So if there's, if, you know, if they can keep rolling those out and get decent writers to expand on those universes, then fantastic. Yeah, I think getting Bill Willingham on this is just a coup. Yeah, hundred percent. And like I said, I mean, I can't even remember who wrote the Death Dealer one, but I, I bought the first one and I and I put it on order with you guys because I loved the covers and I wanted the artwork and I wanted to collect it because I'm a Frazetta yeah. fan. Didn't bother reading the rest because the first one, I, I just put them in the box and I was just like, uh, you know. I so didn't I never... read that one. I didn't actually do that one. Yeah. I'm going to have to have a look at it now. Yeah, go and read it. I mean, I just felt like the first, the first like I say, the first, maybe I should go and dig the others out, but it just felt like they were just speeding through the story and a lot of shit didn't make sense. Right. Yeah. I wonder who I wonder who did write. I'm sorry, I don't know who wrote that because you do have the instance, Ricardo, where yeah. the first issue can be so frustrating, and if you persevere with it, the writer just takes a little bit longer to get going. And there's some big writers who haven't actually mastered that first issue release for the timing of the story. Yeah, right. I'm just so, looking it up yeah. now. Who did write it? Mitch Iverson, who did Voltron Legendary Defender. And D-O-T-A, Dragon's Blood, neither of which I know, uh, um, he wrote it. So, 
Okay, well, maybe don't persevere with it. Don't do yeah. any of his work. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but anyway, yeah. the, the the idea is that if you bought Death Dealer and were disappointed by the writing, don't let it put you on fire and ice because it was fantastic. <laughs> I've had so many people coming into the shop for it who don't get regular comics, but in the ether they've heard about it and they've just gone, fire and ice, no way, yeah, and they're in here for it. It's hilarious. But I actually really loved it, so... Yeah, yeah, that no, was good. All right, book three, and this was one that uh, when we were going, what else are we going to do? I just saw this, and because of my fantasy <laughs> head, the cover pop. Chris Wild Goose has done the artwork, and G Willow Wilson has written it. I didn't know either of them beforehand, but reading the book, it actually, the the story is nothing like it. But the artwork reminds me a bit of the saga artwork. Did yeah, you- it's a it, yeah, G Willow Wilson. It, yeah, it's a little bit like saga and it kind of reads easily like saga. g willow wilson's won so many awards what has she done ms marvel wonder woman poison mm. ivy we've got customers who just will buy anything g willow wilson does and i loved this yeah the hunger in the dusk so basically it's another fantasy it's a world building thing it felt a little bit like rat queens mm. like irreverent survival ego kind of in the structure of it and two enemies coming together to fight the bigger one the pace was really solid page turning I loved the art but once again that might have been because it felt rat queen ish so and it was pure action adventure for me but very quickly I kind of was on board with the main characters kind of liked the idea of the coming together of the orcs and the humans. I have no idea what the enemy is or how where that enemies come from. They're, and I loved that as well. Like it was a, an interesting mix of like apocalyptic end times with fantasy that feels really primitive. You remember the um, Kiwi comic artist uh, and, and writer Marty? Um, well, they used to just call him Marty Fuck, but Marty Edmund? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Not the, like like I said, most of the art style reminds me of Saga, but the the antagonists in this, who we don't know much about, are drawn more like in his style, aren't oh, they? They, actually, they kind of, yeah. They look quite different to the, everybody else that's in the book. Yeah. They definitely have that. Yeah, they that, do, actually. Yeah, so I, I mean that's the first thing that stood out, and I thought it was that's really clever from the artist. Like everybody doesn't look the same. You know who the antagonists are. They look yeah. that much different, and not just because you know they've got horns or anything, but they actually they're drawn completely differently. Yeah, and there's two different, completely different species coming together, so you know where you're at. And the main protagonist losing his family in that as a young child, and then we move forward to this time where he's going to collaborate with the orcs and he's he's a young adult so you very quickly had an emotional tie to him that i thought was in keeping with sword and sorcery stories where yeah. there's been this hardship in youth and that's what those times were like in humans history right well that was Hard that's what happened to conan right yeah, well, yeah. Hmm. yeah. Yeah, so everything everything comes back to Conan eventually. So, oh my um, God, we've <laughs> just done three Conan stories essentially, <laughs> just with different titles. How did you get that? You wouldn't have got that past you. No, I wouldn't have. <laughs> I wouldn't have. One of the other things I thought that the writer did really well here, early on in the piece, right? <laughs> because you've got these young boys picking apples off a tree, and then one of them says, "It's orcs," and they go running. Right, and the orcs see them now. As soon as that happened, I was like, "Okay, we're getting straight into the action here." But these orcs are not bothered; they're completely nonplussed. They're riding their bulls and they're having a conversation about it. So yeah. it's like, "Look at that!" Already scattering. <laughs> One of them says, "Do you think their mothers tell them stories about us at night that we build our winter halls with the bones of human children and bathe in blood?" And then one of the others one said, uh, when was the last time you bathed in anything? You know, so like immediately yeah. <laughs> they kind of, the writers humanized the, the the orcs as well, like made yeah. them they're not just a, they're not a monster, they're 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 another creature, another humanoid creature who's just effectively just like us. So they normalized the orcs really early in the story. The whole tongue in cheek humor around that, the banter that was going on was just brilliant. And that's kind of what made me feel like it was Rat Queens. It felt yeah. a little bit like that because of that matey banter and carry on. 
and it carried on even when even later on when the two the girl healer from the orcs was given over to the humans and the and that the guy, the boys joking about it saying it almost feels like a wedding you know and they're like <laughs> <laughs> this matched wedding and they're having a little bit of a giggle about it even though they're not happy about the situation and it's just this it just felt colloquial language and just comfortable and paced really well and a, and a great place to get on board you know i yeah. think a really great place to get on board with the story I, I mean i think sir but you'll know better than me because i haven't read a lot of saga but i mean if you're a saga fan you'll like this but also if you're a, more of a fantasy fan that you'll like this as well yeah so saga did have some solid sci-fi stuff but it, this is building the characters the connection to the characters like you did in sci- in saga really quickly yeah it feels easy to read like saga i i just loved it i thought mm. it was another great fantasy yeah another great fantasy story because that's what we need more of great fantasy <laughs> stories especially on this podcast uh the <laughs> hunger and the dusk it is called g willow wilson and chris wild goose on this and they've done a fantabulous <laughs> job i think it's uh, fair to say <laughs> oh Stu's going to love this podcast. He is, isn't he? He is. It's so, all right, Stu. We'll put laser guns and aliens in the next one, all right? <laughs> oh, um, don't promise that. <laughs> <laughs> There's some good fantasy coming out. <laughs> uh, actually, just on that, Sue, it's, it's something slightly off topic, but from a gaming point of view, how's this? So Larian Studios, who are, I think, Swedish or Danish company, have been working on Baldur's Gate 3 right mm. which has just dropped so they've just released it the gameplay the animation everything uh, is just absolutely superb oh, wow. uh, guess how many people have downloaded the game it released i think august the 3rd or august the 4th oh uh, th- 750,000 over oh my god so oh it, my god which means there's you know if they've had this amount of success this early there's going to be more fantasy games coming as the, well. The Baldur's Gate comic was brilliant. Yeah. Well, they, they, I mean, really they've, done a, they've done a really good job on this. And I'll send you the trailer to look at. You should look at the just the trailer for the game. is yeah. about two and a half minutes. It is mind-blowing. I put it on the TV at home. <laughs> didn't say anything. I just put it on. And Rachel thought it was a movie. Yeah. It's, just oh. like, it's so beautifully done cinematically. Fantastic. Oh, so wow. Fantasy is on the rise again, which is great. Oh, it should be. It's number one. Number one. All right, let's let's cross over to do something that's not fan. Well, it's kind of fantastical, but it's more horror, isn't it? Uh, from uh, what do you mean you haven't read that? And that is the Sixth Gun by uh, Cullen Bunn and Brian Hurt. Oh, Cullen Bunn, he's just <gasps> he's so he's he's the most wonderful guy. I've played Tim from Bowling with him, and he's just he's one of those guys that you he's quite creepy, and I think it's 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 a weird kind of horror creep around him and he writes a lot of horror and I've we've put Stu's probably talked about some of this horror before with you and it's mm. like under under the skin creepy you can feel like what you've read wasn't that you know amazingly horrorful because it's not jump start horror but very supernatural he he grew up his dad was a hypnotist in a traveling hypnotherapy show stage show and then he ended up on a farm when he was a teenager that he absolutely hated an isolated small town farm so all of those kind of mind weird trick small town vibes are put into his comics and this this six gun it's a crazy western horror and twisted layers of like supernatural demons and weirdness and it's got all the wonderful horror tropes in it and western tropes like this the the action the crime and the redemption and some really beautiful subliminal stuff going on in there as Mm. well or stuff that's not actually like there's a I'm probably getting ahead of myself here but there's a bad guy in it who's kind of half dead supernaturally dead and he has a posse around him and the posse is four horsemen Mm. and he never gets on a horse. So it is the true four horsemen. And I like just little things like that, that aren't even mentioned or talked about, but the symbolism in Cullen Bunn's stuff is what seeps it under your skin without you realizing it's getting under your skin. Yeah. So basically it's set after the American civil war and it's a story about six dark guns 
Uh, each gun has a specific power, but once you touch that gun, you're bonded with it until you die. Mm. So and if anybody else grabs it, they get like some sort of eldritch blast type shock thing to offer, don't they? Yeah, yeah. No one else can touch it or use it. And these six guns together will bring about the doom of the world, we're supposing. We don't – so there's a, there was a general in the American Civil War, General Hume, and he somehow procured these guns from some dark entity and he had his taken off him by a preacher and he was supposedly dead, but it was a kind of a supernatural dead. And so this is the story about General Hume and his widow – Hume trying to bring him back to take possession of that sixth gun again, but they've got to find sixth gun from the preacher, and it's a doozy. It's That's a, a, you know, I mean, I, it's it can be a bit lazy just to compare stuff, but I love Once in Future King, yes, or Once in Future, I should say, and it, it feels like an American version of that. Right, yeah. in terms of it's it's horror and it's going back and finding like you know the Thunderbird, for example, is in this and and those um, myths and legends from the land tie into the story as it moves along as well. So I yeah. thought that that was um, that's really clever. Uh, the storytelling is really clever, and the, the fact that you know the the main guy who's I guess the hero of the story isn't really a hero. Like there's 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 no black and oh. white. There's just a lot of grey. Uh, so um, it's, Drake... it's black and grey actually, isn't it? It's black and grey. Yeah. So Drake is this character who had been a part of the Civil War, New General Hume, you, and there was this myth that General Hume had died, and there was this massive treasure in this place called the Moor, and so people wanted to get that treasure. And so somehow Drake has used supernatural leanings to convene with ghosts and find out where this gun is because it will lead him to the treasure and it's the sixth gun, right? And so the very first time we come into contact with Drake, he's he's found a map to the supernatural tree where all these people have been hanged. So it's the ghosts hanging from the tree and he has this dealing and he strikes a deal with them and he agrees that he'll burn the mat to them so they can have some peace. And the very first thing he does is he doesn't honour his deal. And it's just <laughs> like, who is this guy? And it's just, okay, I mean, are, are we going to like this guy? He's, he's the main character. What's going on here? And Cullen does this really well. He twists you around with moral and ethical dilemma in a situation that is so... It's Western. It's set mm. from a realistic era in humanity's time, right? And he puts in, he even puts in the Pinkerton Detective Agency. So we know, we know they existed. So there's this realism running through the story with this horror, supernatural demons appearing when they need to kind of war going on, really. Yeah, and and to add to that, like he's he's dotted things through it. Like there's a part where General Hume says to his wife, once he's kind of back, he's like he rode with the Grey Ghost, General, uh, you know, Morby's Raiders. And yeah. I went, I thought to myself, I've I've listened and watched a lot of Civil War docos, and I thought that name rings a bell. So I looked it up, true person. So he's yeah. he's scattered real people throughout it as references, not the characters themselves, but people have been involved with in the past. Yeah, yeah. He always oh, does this with everything he writes. There's so many layers. <laughs> I said to um, there's a there's a woman in our graphic novel club that we have here at the shop, and so we do a different gra graphic novel every month. We pull it apart and we all discuss it. And there's one lady, Jody, and she is hilarious because. So I think Six Gun was the very first comic that Stu and I sold to her. We said, you'll love it. And she instantly bought the entire series of Six Gun. She, I think she bought it in multiple prints, won't lend it to anybody, talks about it to anybody and everybody, buys everything Callan Bunn does. But at Graphic Novel Club, no matter what it is that we're talking about, she will bring in the six gun. <laughs> she will have something about that book that she can relate back to the six gun. I said to her, I'm going to do this on the pod. She was so excited. She said she was going to give us a, uh, a little paragraph to read, but she didn't. She obviously got too busy. But she, yeah, this six gun has a bit of a cult following. 
through the store. And I and I love it. I understand why. Because it does that whole Western, it gives you the vastness of the landscape, the dusty, dirty air. You can almost like feel it and smell it. And so it's all the visuals that we expect. But then emerging from that dust is the demons and the beasts. And, and they're not there all the time, but they are so perfectly there when they need to be. And so the horror, even though it's a horror and that's the overriding element of it, it's so well done in this Western trope. Brilliantly done. I mean, and that's the thing with Cullen Bunn. He does horror so well. I mean, I've, I'm trying to remember what else we've done, but we've done a bunch. I think Ghost Law is him, isn't it? Yeah, Ghost Law is him. Yeah, yep. so we did that not only not that long ago. So we've done a bit of Cullen Bunn. Was The Crimson Cage, was that Cullen Bunn as well? Yes, I think that was. Did you do Regression? That was Cullen. No, I don't think we've done Regression, but yeah, we've done a bunch of stuff. I mean, like, I, yeah. he, he's another one for me, like James Tinney, and if I see his name on something, I'm like, oh, I'll grab that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And he's he's one that he's like his horror is like Junji Ito's for me because you don't expect the impact it has and days later you're thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. It worms its way in, doesn't it? Definitely worms yeah. its way in. And especially, I mean, yeah, once again, the reason I picked this up was I didn't even realize it was Cullen Bunn at first when I picked it up. I picked it up based off the cover art and the fact that I knew it was supernatural but western because I love western stuff and I love supernatural stuff. And I'm like, oh, hang on, you've got me here. And then it, later on, I realized it was Cullen Bunn and I'm like, well, bang, bang, bang. This is three strikes. I'm having this. Because you asked for this. When did you? When did you get this? Because uh well, maybe a month or so ago six weeks ago i, I wasn't that aware right. of it i saw it online they're doing a, a kickstarter at the moment to do a deluxe edition of some description yeah. and that's where i saw it and i was like oh this looks cool and then i saw it in store yeah it's one of our solids it's one i will reread every year and yeah i absolutely love it it's almost a steampunky feel to it which mm. you kind of sl- they kind of slip that in every now and then yeah, something like that happens. Yeah, you're right. It does have yeah. a little bit of that because I mean the the other thing is that the uh, the main guy isn't dressed like a cowboy. He's dressed more like a Pinkerton detective, right? So he doesn't yeah. necessarily look that Western. He kind of yeah. looks old time, but not Western. Maybe that gives it some of that steampunk leaning as well. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, there you go. The Sixth Gun, Cullen Bunn, Brian Hurt, Book One, Cold Dead Fingers is what we've been talking about. But there are <laughs> how many how many books are there? Is there six or seven? I think there's six. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Look that up before I started. But uh, you're yeah, fantastic. <laughs> well worth a read. Definitely ch- chuck that in uh, into your reading pile. All right, so I think I think we're just about done. And, and we, is there anything else you want to talk about about the shop before we go? Uh, nope. All good in the shop. Yeah. Excellent. Picking along. Good stuff. It's uh, been a pleasure as always. Thank you, Ricardo.